So why you had to have a cloud service strategy, right? Uh, obviously, there are tons of uh, cloud services available, software as a service especially. Um, so in open source, we uh, use a motor called standing on the soldiers, uh, shoulders of the giants, right? Uh, that's the open source motto. Basically, you use other open source libraries to build your open source projects. Now, with the uh, cloud, uh, cloud era with the uh, service SaaS applications. Now that open source library has been moved away and the APIs are getting that particular position. So you have tons of APIs, tons of cloud services available and uh, uh, basically you build applications, you build your capabilities by using the functionalities provided by all these public uh, services, all the uh, SaaS applications. And obviously, you or your customers might already be using some of these uh, services like Salesforce or uh, Jira or uh, many other services already. So you don't have any other option but to integrate with those systems if you want to get a seamless uh, view of the applications. Then the second question is on cloud identity. Why you can't avoid cloud identities, right? Again, uh, people are having increased number of social identities. I'm pretty sure all of you here has some social identities, either Facebook or Google, or Gmail, or whatever the social identities. And this Gardner predicted, this report came like one year, two years back. They predicted by the end of 2015, 50% of the retail customer identities will be based on social network identities. So if you, if you don't consider the social identities, now you are going to lose a majority of your customer base or potential customer base uh, who, are, who can consume your services, who can consume your applications. That means you have to have a set strategy to bring them in to the platform, bring them in to use your applications. Then the application development. So the application development requirements for now is like it has to be very agile, meaning like uh, you come up with an idea, you just build the applications, you move very fast and then uh, deploy the application into production. They are like API driven. Uh, almost all the functionalities are provided by either public services or within your organizations, they are providing some services. Or uh, they have polyglot language or polyglot technology, data. Ba ba basically, the, the, the developers need to have access to various uh, technologies. I, either it can be data databases, or it can be programming languages, or it can be uh, several technologies, and so on. So as, as a company, you sh has to provide, you have to provide uh, all these functionalities to your developers. Then these applications require quick release cycles. So that means uh, 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 you have to provide all the infrastructure, all the facilities, so that people can move very fast do the releases uh, very fast and innovate very fast. And it also has to support uh, uh, long tails of application. So generally in a conventional cases, people uh, provision servers for the applications and that means it has some cost associated with your application development. That means if the application will not be used by many people, then it's, uh, it's not uh, possible to spend money on provisioning this stuff, right? But in the current era, you are coming up with some uh, innovative ideas. You don't know how many people are going to use it. It can come as a hot topic, it can come as a viral application, or it might not be achieving the momentum as you have, uh, as you think, right? So that means uh, the application development should support even the uh, the applications which might na might have only one or two customers or one or two users uh, and will be able to scale up or down uh, based on what is needed. Then application runtime is again uh, uh, the, the requirements now is a bit different. First of all, uh, uh, the, the industry is 
uh, getting into the microservices architecture. That means the application runtime environment should support the applications written with microservices architecture in mind. And then the load is unpredictable. Um, so sometimes it might be used by like couple of users, sometimes it might be used by millions of users, or uh, at a pr particular time it might be used by uh, millions of or billions of users. So the load is unpredictable, uh, more or less, right? Uh, if you look at any of the applications, you don't really know um, what kind of load you will get into your application. So again, the application runtime should be able to support all these varying load uh, requirements. And then the scalability of the application or different parts of the applications, uh, the scalability aspect is different. So that means you have some user interfaces, you have some uh, other combinations of uh, various parts in your applications. The scalability of one part might not be same as the scalability of another part. That means the application runtime should be able to handle the scalability requirements of different parts in a different way and then has to provide it, right? So if you look at the conventional ways, the relationship with the IT is very cumbersome, right? If you want to create a database, um, it takes a couple of days on a, on a positive side. Uh, it might take a couple of months even uh, if you had to purchase hardware and uh, licenses and so on. Uh, if you request to create a user, it might take like two, three days. Uh, or if you want to reset your password, it might take like half a day, blah, 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 right? So the, the way conventional IT works is you request a feature from the IT, you raise a ticket uh, for the IT, and then they take uh, a, a, a considerable amount of time to come back and solve the problem or solve the ticket uh, raised by the people, right? So this kind of uh, uh, not facilitate the innovativeness, not facilitate the agileness needed for the new application development era, right? So often this leads to something called shadow IT. So people cut off the IT, go and uh, spawn up instances in EC2 or go and spawn up the in this instances on some other public cloud providers like Google, Compute Cloud, etc., and then uh, they build the applications there, and possibly they might run it on that particular application, totally cutting out the uh, enterprise IT together, or possibly they might bring the application to run it on the enterprise IT. The development is run uh, done there, but to bring the application to run it on the infrastructure provided by the company. But by the time you might find that it violates so many restrictions provided or so many policies provided by the company, right? So it's a waste of time by cutting out the, the IT and then going to the shadow IT. So what you need in order to solve that, basically the platform should have self-service so that people, when they need, they can come and provision any functionalities needed uh, or when they need anything to be done like changing password, etc., they will be able to do on their own. Then it has to provide heterogeneous runtimes, polyglot programming models, technologies, etc., so that people uh, does not get restricted by uh, the facilities provided. So if I have an idea, if I want to implement some idea and my choice of technology might differ from somebody else's choice of technology, and the platform should be able to provide all these facilities, right? Then uh, the platform should also be like workflow driven. Uh, basically, there are some cases where you build some applications, you build some functionalities. It has to go through some uh, workflows. It has to go through some approval process, so it, gets, it has to work th uh, go through from some uh, policy enforcement, etc. So the platform should be able to support all of that functionalities. And obviously, the platform should support the API driven development and then it has to accept creative experimentation uh, again supporting all these uh, long tails of applications so that the cost in order to create a new experimentation or create a new innovative idea should be very less people should be able to just get started and then can run uh, 
implement the applications and then can uh, start together. Uh, and the cost of the development and the runtime environment should be very less, right? So you have to build your cloud strategy by considering all of that, right? So uh, again, I'm not going to tell how exactly you had to build your cloud strategy. It's again different for different companies. My guidelines are like you had to consider all of these factors when you start building your cloud strategy. Again, uh, this become kind of a hot topic with the increased use of the container. So there are several uh, sessions done in the morning of the talk done by uh, the Kubernetes in the morning, uh, talk about the containers and the Kubernetes, etc. Uh, so these containers are used for a long time, uh, especially the LXEs and Linux containers were used for a long time. But it got like uh, uh, the containers kind of become very popular with the introduction of Dockers. Uh, so the, the Docker provides uh, several ways where you can uh, you can script your development environment, your runtime environment in a very easy way with very low cost uh, infrastructure and very low cost uh, uh, environments. So people can build the images, keep it on the registry, and then you can combine multiple images, etc., and then uh, build various applications very easily. Uh, and ca e these containers can support also microservices architecture and uh, can support uh, various scalability levels for different parts of the applications. And then the Kubernetes was built on top of the Docker. Uh, so Kubernetes, again, uh, the Docker has the concept of the containers, uh, but if you look at the applications, most of the time you have the requirements to put multiple application or multiple parts of the application together. Let's take an example of uh, PHP application and the MySQL database, right? Uh, as, a, as a single application, it might be uh, easier to coexist both those co components together in a single machine so in order to reduce the latencies and so on. So the Kubernetes provides a way to define some concept called pods, and then you can define multiple containers as a single pod. And from Kubernetes point of view, the deployment entity is pod, not the containers. So the pod is a collection of containers, and optionally the, it can have some volumes or some uh, some disk volumes as well. Uh, and also Kubernetes has the concept of uh, replication factor. So you can say your application has to run on different machines, and it has to have at least like three instances running. So you can configure everything by providing options to the, um, to the replication factor, or replication controller, and then Kubernetes will take care of running your applications in various uh, combinations. And Kubernetes also working with something called Ubernetes. So Kubernetes is considered for a single infrastructure, but the Ubernetes is again bringing multiple infrastructures together and building a, a hybrid cloud. Um, uh, it can run at a given time in multiple infrastructure as a services uh, together, right? So that means uh, you can provide much higher uh, availability uh, figures, uh, like f if you take like AWS, AWS uh, guarantees like four nines, 99.99. Uh, so if you want to get more than that, you obviously you had to combine multiple infrastructures, uh, services, etc. So uh, this project, this is a rea uh, this is a recently startup uh, started project, uh, which Ubernetes. It tries to achieve that uh, hybrid cloud concepts on top of the Kubernetes cluster. So all of these containers and the uh, Kubernetes again helped us to achieve some of the uh, cloud strategy which we want in order to achieve um, various uh, scalability requirements, various uh, low cost environments, various uh, 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 development environments, etc. So how WSO2 can help? So I'll take one by one. One is the public services. 
So again, I mentioned that there are multiple uh, thousands of public services available, but as an organization, you might not want to allow your developers to use all the services, right? Again, you might have some restriction on using what kind of services. It can be based on the monetary value of the service. It can be based on the license of the service, and etc. So from your organization's strategy, strategy point of view, you might want to restrict what other services can be used by your developers to write the applications. So the, ap the API manager can help in order to achieve that. Basically, the API manager will allow you to define APIs or what kind of public APIs you can be used internally within your organization by defining APIs within the API manager and then let your developers to use only those APIs which are exposed through the API manager to build the applications, right? So that will uh, restrict what kind of APIs which are used, which can be used by your developers to build the applications. And then uh, um, the other using public services is on integrating the services together. So if you have your private services of your infrastructure uh, and you want to use some of the public uh, services available, then you can use WSO2 ESB and the connectors. So connector is a, a, a building block which you can use it in the WSO2 ESB which can be, uh, which can access to publicly available uh, SaaS services. So we build like 140 plus connectors and it can be downloaded from store.wso2.com. Uh, we build connectors for publicly available and commonly used services um, which are readily available. But if there are any other services which you want to build, um, you can easily build a custom connector and then plug it into the ESB. So this is the other way where you can use public services. Again, let your developers to use public services by defining some of the connectors and then uh, let them to use the connectors rather than directly consuming the services. Again, uh, extension of the connectors is the integration cloud. This is something we are working on. Basically, this defines uh, commonly used uh, scenarios uh, and define them as the integration templates. Um, so what happens is like uh, integration cloud is meant to be cloud-to-cloud uh, -cloud integration, but you can also use it to do cloud-to-enterprise integration as well. Um, you can define commonly used scenarios as integration template. For example, in this particular example, it searches for a tweet and then uh, send an email. Uh, searches for a tweet with a particular hashtag and send an email, which is a common, um, or which is uh, can be parameterized so that you can reuse again and again. Or you might want to read something from the Salesforce, uh, write it to your Google spreadsheet, which is again kind of happening again and again. So you can define those kind of scenarios as integration template and then can use it in the uh, cloud. Then using the services, uh, sorry, using the identity, uh, public, uh, uh, public identities, etc., can be achieved using the identity server. So the identity server allows you to have identity federation. You can define multiple identity providers within the identity server. For example, if you have Facebook uh, identities, you have Google identities, etc. You can define multiple authenticators within the identity server and let your users to authenticate against those public identities through the identity server and thereby federating all the social identities within your applications. Right? So your application has to de uh, depend only on the identity server, and the identity server is configured to consume all other identities, all other social identities, so that uh, you do the federations within your organization. So the other part of the federation is the provisioning part. Again, there are cases where you let the users to use social identities, but when they use it, you might want to create some of the identities from your system or 
when a user comes, you might want to create identities in multiple systems, etc. So, Identity Server provides this provisioning framework where you can define multiple uh, provisioning rules so that uh, when a user is provisioned or deprovisioned, it will happen in various systems automatically. So the other way WSO2 helps is run WSO2 products on Kubernetes. Basically, this is again can go as your cloud strategy. Uh, so the way we allow people to run it in Kubernetes is uh, we uh, provide some of the pod definitions. Uh, so you can run multiple um, manager clouds. Uh, so the WSO2 product has the management nodes and the worker nodes. So you can define different replication factor, different replication controller for the manager nodes and different replication controller for the worker nodes. And um, the Kubernetes will handle all the scalability and all the uh, high availability. So private pass is the other uh, cloud service, which uh, cloud product which we offer. Again, private pass can run on top of uh, Stratos or on top of Kubernetes. Um, so private pass allows you to take any WSO2 products or even non WSO2 products and run it on a multi tenant uh, scalable auto scaled way on top of uh, uh, Stratos or on top of Kubernetes. Um, so, this is again one of the products you can uh, use to build your applications uh, uh, in order to provide all these scalable requirements. So, Factory is other products which we, uh, uh, which we use to help customers. Uh, to bring all the development aspects together. Uh, so this brings all the lifecycle management of the application starting from the inception of the application to actually you run it on production and then take it all the way to the retirement. It brings all the tools together and then it provides various runtimes so that you can build the applications, test it, uh, take it in various life cycles and eventually go into the production. So this provides a very isolated environment for your developers and they can come and create all the necessary tools, all the necessary runtimes environments uh, with very low cost and they can get going. So it brings all the development environments, tools and SVNs, uh, issue tracking systems, uh, um, test automation this systems, etc., together and provide a seamless environment for you to write applications. So these are the primary products we help in order to achieve the cloud strategy. And then uh, you can build your own cloud strategy by using these products. It helps you to uh, enforce some of the restrictions, some of the uh, best practices for your organizations. And you can build your cloud strategy by considering all these products. Uh, so the cloud, uh, we build a public cloud as well, uh, WSO2 Cloud, which brings all these App Factory and all other products and then provide you. Uh, so this is one of the other option where you can use to build applications, use to build APIs by uh, not having the uh, on-premise products, but to use the publicly hosted instance of WSO2 products. With that, I conclude this uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs>